so I think one of the most interesting things we found is to be able to compare these carnivores that were around with the sauropods of so things like Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus um, with the big tyrannosaurs. So everyone's familiar with tyrannosaurs and these guys had a particularly strong bite. And in the past, we've thought of them perhaps not as being specialist bone biters, but certainly much better at it than a lot of these other carnivores that were living alongside the sauropods. And what we found is actually there were rather more bites in the Morrison formation than we really expected. And whilst it's not as high as the numbers we see for tyrannosaur centric faunas, they were definitely higher. So we're seeing more bites on these sauropod bones than we would normally, or perhaps than we expected. And that's an indication of the kind of interactions that are going on, which is something I think paleontologists had massively underestimated before. We thought they were super rare. And actually when you really look for them, they're pretty common. Hi, my name is Dr. Dave Hone. I'm a paleontologist at Queen Mary University of London here in the UK. In this new paper, what we're really trying to piece together is what was happening with the big sauropods. So that's the big long neck, long tailed, big body dinosaurs like Diplodocus and Brontosaurus and Brachiosaurus in the Morrison formation. So that's an area about 150 million years old in Western USA. Uh, and what's happening with them and the carnivores that lived alongside them, particularly the big carnivores. And basically, were they primarily scavenging bodies or were they actively hunting big adult sauropods? And what other interactions might be at play in there that we can piece together? And this is all based on the bite marks on bones of sauropods. So where these carnivores have fed on these bodies and left traces from their teeth in the bones. Our findings in the study were surprising to us in several ways. On one hand, we found a lot more bones with bite marks on them than we had known existed. We think that a lot of these just haven't been reported in the scientific literature. On the other hand, in terms of the population of sauropod bones in museums, we didn't find that many with bite marks, about 11% the teeth of the large predatory theropod dinosaurs from the Morrison, things like Allosaurus, Torvosaurus, and Ceratosaurus, often have pretty heavy wear, the kind of wear that indicates tooth on bone contact. So what we think is that the big predatory theropods were specializing in killing the baby and juvenile sauropods and only attacking the adults as a last resort, or when they were really sick, or perhaps they were mostly scavenging the adults. We think this because something had to be happening to all the bones of those baby and juvenile sauropods. All the bite marks that we find on these sauropod bones were either showing a lack of healing, so they didn't happen like predation attempts, or genuinely appeared to be scavenging which begs the question, what are these big carnivores eating most of the time if they're not tending to kill big sauropods and they're only tending to scavenge them? And the answer to that probably lies in the juveniles. Predators of all types, and indeed we actually think dinosaur predators, tended to favor young prey. Juveniles are um, very often naive with regards to predation and they're more vulnerable to predators. And remember, with something like a sauropod that's 20, 30 tons of adult, a juvenile can still be one or two tons. It's a very big animal, but it's still actually quite young and still vulnerable relative to these big carnivores. And that fits with the pattern that we see because actually what we don't tend to find is juvenile bones with bites on them. And that's probably because they've been destroyed. They've been consumed and broken up and basically wrecked and don't enter the fossil record because big carnivores have just chewed up and pretty much destroyed the entire animal. But when you've got a 20 or 30 ton carcass and the bones might be, you know, 15, 20 centimeters plus across, even the big theropods can't destroy them. And so those bones tend to survive with the bite marks. So we've actually kind of got an absence of evidence, the lack of those babies telling us something about what's happening with the predation habits. And so that's why they're not showing up in the fossil record. They got eaten and it's only the adults which are probably largely immune to predation, who when they die, don't get destroyed, but they do might get scavenged and take some injuries that we find them. And that's what we're covering in this paper. One of the things we looked at as well is 
can we marry up some of these carnivores to the actual bite when you've got a sauropod bone with a bunch of score marks from teeth or even chunks missing can you work out which carnivore did it um in the past i and various other people have said that's probably a bad idea there's so much variation you know a little allosaurus might look like a big ceratosaurus and can you tell um but we went into some more depth of this with one of our colleagues uh, Christoph Hendricks in particular, who's on the paper, and he was able to determine that at least a few of them we could assign to some of the bigger carnivores out there and rule out some of the other species. It's not as detailed as we would like, but the fact that we can even do it for some specimens is really quite useful information and be able to say, okay, we're pretty confident that this carnivorous dinosaur was responsible for this bite, and then it bit through this much bone and therefore its teeth were this strong and we can fit in some more bits of ecology through that way. We did a big survey. We systematically surveyed more than 600 sauropod bones, but there's probably 10 times that many in museums across the country. Uh, we hope that our study inspires other people to go and do a lot more of this sort of thing. The only collection we looked through systematically was the one at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. But there are collections in Wyoming and Utah and Colorado and Oklahoma and other places that people could go through in the same level of detail we did. And who knows what we'll find. And one thing we'll definitely find is more data that we can add to this mystery of how these big dinosaurs were coexisting in the late Jurassic.